I want to take the opportunity to welcome everyone to this ancient friends meeting house. It's one of the oldest in the area and, and it's uh, under the supervision and ownership of the Dartmouth Monthly Meeting. And uh, because of the um, early, um, I'm going to have a, a rambling talk, but I'm going to try and bring in all of the aspects of who were the Quakers and what effect did they have on the history of the making of Dartmouth and what participation and heartache went through the whole thing. Oh, before I really get started, uh, I, I request that everyone turn off their cell phones, I mean their cell phones. <laughs> Okay, let's start. Our story begins in Lancashire, England. A young man by the name of George Fox, son of Christopher and Martha Logo, at an early age was curious about faith that would answer that of God in every human person. He kept a journal. The journal is still in print today after 380 years. He taught, he taught on Christian perfection because the Quakers were, were a sect, but they were Christian, and that's a point I want to make. Um, he was imprisoned in 1652. He spoke to his converts about the Spirit of God and the theory of God as the light within. The Quaker movement grew like wildfire. The jails in England and Ireland were filled with these converts. In 1658, if you can remember, I'm, I'm trying to do it chronologically, and in 1658, Anne Austin and Mary Fisher who were converts to Quakerism, reached Boston as the first Quakers missionaries. They were deported to the Barbados, being accused of, of all things, witches. On another ship of Quakers, Quaker received Mary Dyer and her husband returned from England on the Woodhouse, the ship the Woodhouse, to Long Island Christopher Holder and John Copeland were bandished from Martha's Vineyard where the Indians had given them welcome. In Boston they were jailed without food and water and whipped. And some had their right ears removed, as, um, such as Christopher <coughs> Holder he being known as the mutilated. Then there was Mary Dyer, who uh, was bandished from um, Boston to, Ports, uh, to Portsmouth, Rhode Island. She returned to Boston three times with her Bible under her arm and walking or riding a horse to get to, um, to Boston. She was hung on Boston Common along with two other friends for being Quaker. The person who maneuvered the trap door was so affected by how she met her death with the with, uh, uh, cheerfulness and no remorse that she was there because she wanted the word to get out about Quakerism. 
George Fox, going back to the founder, died in 1692, having been visited here in 1672 and 1673. The Quaker movement was named then, they were the children of the light, meaning that there's a spirit in each of us and that we uh, are endowed with that. Uh, and uh, also, it was, they were known as the Society of Friends. They were not known as Quakers because Quakers was a, um, uh, a, a name that was not respectful. But anyway, we, we're still Quakers. <laughs> The one thing about George Fox and his theory was that women are equal to men and, you know, through centuries of civilization, that wasn't the case. So the um, meeting structure was set up and the women sat on one side of the meeting house with these panel structures that would, could be lowered and, um, and uh, uh, removed. And so the women had their own meeting. They had matters to discuss pertaining to family life, education, and other things. And the men had such things as, you know what men, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, Money, <laughs> money, and and the means of uh, building homes and, and and raising animals and things like that. Um, then there was the yearly meeting structure, and that was the highest structure there is in Quakerism. Is the yearly meeting is a geographical area set aside, and and uh, they have their work to do. So the New England Yearly Meeting was located in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, because there seemed to be a swarm of Quakers here. <laughs> and uh, so, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you some Quakers from here. And, and they may be related to you or, or not, but in my talk I will refer to them. There was George Allen, uh, no, jo George Aiken, and then there was Anna Almy and George Almy, and Hannah uh, Brightman, Philip Cornell, my great great grandfather, and uh, Charles Fisher. <laughs> then there was Jane Fisher, George Francis, uh, oh, Eunice Gidley, Ephraim Gifford, Hilda Gifford, Phoebe Gifford, Nathaniel Howland, David Potter, and I'm having trouble just, hmm? Isaac Potter. Isaac Potter. Isaac Potter. Isaac Potter. Okay. 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 Here's Sarah Potter, Angeline Ricketson, Henry Slocum, Maria and Moses Smith, Mary Smith, and William Tucker. So these are all names that they were, they were people and they were Quakers and they were very active in this meeting house. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the Aponagansett Stone Bridge. Do you know where it is? Okay. Do you know it's condemned? The fire trucks can't go over it now? 
um, and uh, uh, 18 wheelers can't go over it now. Uh, but I don't know where the watchdog is that's watching because I'm sure that it's still being used. But this is the um, two section bridge that was filmed in Down to the Sea in Ships. And it's right out here. If you go out the driveway, turn right, and, and you go over it, and you don't even know you're over it. Okay. 1871 map of Dartmouth. How many people here are from Dartmouth? Oh, that's a good turnout. All right, well, 1871 was a wonderful year because many things happened, including the map. <laughs> uh, the schoolhouse in Russell's Mills was built. And it was through that, through that saving of that building, our historical society has risen. And, and I hope that everyone that has an interest in history will join our society because we plan to have other lectures also and other interesting programs. Now, in the lower section here is um, the uh, Russell's Mills map sh showing all the families that lived in Russell's Mills. Do you know why it's Russell's Mills? <coughs> because a man came from Taunton by a Rainham or Rainham by a Taunton by the name of Russell and he knew how to set up ironworks and he moved to Russell's Mills where there was a mill set up for rendering iron. Also in Russell's Mills is two grist mills. One has been restored, it's the Allen Grist Mill on Slate Scona Road. The other one is non-existent. It is where, if you go to the waterfalls in Russell's Mills, the last gully that goes to the falls is the um, uh, Heron Run. And the, right beside the Heron Run was the Cummins Grist Mill. And when Beverly Glennon wrote her book on Dartmouth, um, she used William Wall's painting of the waterfalls at Russell's Mills. And there um, is the remnants of the grist mill that was owned by uh, the Cummins family. The other thing is that just below Duval's store uh, is the town landing. And at the town landing, uh, that is where they built whale ships. There was an industry of, of whale, um, or building of whale ships so that they could float them down the river, down the uh, Pascomi and sit down into Slocum River. I, I still haven't decided where the demarcation between Slocum River and Pascomi and sit is, but uh, I don't know. But then up in the corner here is uh, an insert map of Smith Mills. Now, I would not want to omit North Dartmouth from our territory. But we had, he, we had more life and activity down here. Um, so that we need to do more research on the founding of the Smith Mill area. Smith Mills, actually, that wasn't its original name. The original name for Smith Mills was called Newtown. And if you go up uh, off Fonce Connor Road, you uh, come to 
um, an entrance to what used to be Inn and Hope, and there's a bank there. Well, if you go by the bank, there's a side road, you can actually come to a cemetery. And that is a Quaker cemetery, and that is known as the Newtown Cemetery, Quaker Cemetery. The meeting house got torn down or moved. I haven't been able to, to find any record of what happened to the Newtown Friends Meeting. But um, over on um, State Road and Tucker Road, there was a Friends Meeting, the North Dartmouth Friends Meeting, and uh, the uh, membership had, had dwindled and elderly and there was need to move it. So they decided that they would buy land behind the Friends Cemetery uh, on, Horse, on uh, Old Westport Road and Chase Road. That cemetery is still there. And the land that they bought to move the cemetery is still there. We, we would like to sell it because it, it has no reason for being at this point because the four remaining members of Smith Mills of uh, North Dartmouth Friends Meeting decided to give it as a gift to Woman Hill, which is in South Deerfield, Mass. And it's a, it's a conference center. It's in a glorious spot. And yeah. And oh, oh, before I get to the uh, meeting house, this is a list of business notices of all the people who did business in um, 1871. Uh, and, uh, and, and they listed as Dartmouth, South Dartmouth, etc., and what the business was, what they manufactured. Sherman, A.D. Sherman manufactured salt. Uh, Alvin Sherman was a farmer, but it doesn't say, I guess he probably sold milk or he sold vegetables or fruit or something. And then there was the dry goods store, the Slocum dry goods store, and the Charles Tucker, um, it doesn't say what he did either, but it's South Dartmouth. And then there's another salt works in um, South Dartmouth. Um, and then there's another farmer on Potomska Road in Dartmouth. And another Benjamin Wing of South Dartmouth. Um, Charles Howland, W. Howland, um, was a farmer. And Nathaniel Howland manufactured uh, salt. And uh, a, a, uh, Spooner Jenkins was a shipmaster. And Nathaniel Potter, um, I think it says bees, or, yeah. And then there was a uh, dealer, another dealer in dry goods. But that's the list, and, and you can get that online. You can look it up and decide where. It, you may even own the property that some of these businesses were on. Now, this is North Dartmouth at Smith Mills. Um, you can see it's uh, the pass, how big the pass it in width, and I have no idea of what happened. How did the land shrink uh, or something? <laughs> something happened because the pass isn't that wide up in the trunk. And uh, so, now, this is a little more of North Dartmouth. But these are the inserts out of the 1871 um, uh, map of Dartmouth. Now, this is getting to Russell's Mills. We have up here, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think you can really see it, 
is Frank Duvall and his store. And Frank smoked cigars. So I had to find a picture of Frank to uh, kind of give you the flavor of the store. I mean, you, you could smell the cigars and the, and the, and the, and the men would come in and, and sit at the stove and talk and they had their little coffee uh, catch. Now this is the, the front of Duval's store, the road being unpaved and in the front you could see a Model T Ford right there. And, uh, so, and it still exists, and that's the wonderful part. We have to save what we have. And I think that Dartmouth will... Now, this is the wedding, a friend's wedding in 1924 of Mary E. Gifford and Raymond F. Duvall, son of Frank. And um, Mary was a school teacher. She also came from the Gifford family that was enormous in size. And, and I, have, I have a lot of pictures of, of them. But anyway, they, uh, they were wed, wed at, um, at Allen's Neck. <coughs> now, back in 1913, um, there was more Duvalls family members. So if there's any information that you want, I've got all of this in my computer so I can provide it. Now this is the Allen family. <coughs> How many people here have heard of uh, Harry Allen? Harry Allen was a, c a custom cabinet maker and was married to one of those Gifford girls, <laughs> Lizzie. And here is, a, it says Harry Allen, Hetty Gifford, Lizzie Gifford, Leona Gifford, Warren Gifford, and Ella and Mary and Clarence Giffords. All Giffords. Hmm? Oh. Okay. Now this is in their old age, a picture that I was able to find. In their old age was Lizzie, Lenore, uh, Mary, Clarence, Gladys, Harry, Raymond. Um, no, Harry wasn't a Gifford. He, oh, the, oh, the Allen, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Cecil, Cliff, George and Chester. So you put the Gifford family and the Allen family together and you've got a bunch of people. <laughs> but the one thing that was so, so wonderful about is that they were able to keep their faith. And I think that is the one thing um, in the Sunday school at Allen's Neck, um, the class was asked, describe God. This was like, say, 10-year-old kids. And one of the replies was, Harry Allen. <laughs> <laughs> and it was true. He was truly a deep, devoted Christian and Quaker. Okay. Now, this is the uh, Slocum River landing. So the Slocum River landing, that just answered my question, is right uh, almost to the shallow part of, of um, Pascamansa. You know, the, it's kind of rocky there after the falls, then there's this rocky area. And so, and this is where the whale ships were built. It was here and then they would just uh, float them down the river. Now, we're getting back to North Dartmouth. This is the old friends meeting house that was located at the corner of Tucker Road and State Road. And 
it was given to Woman Hill Conference Center and the members paid a man for a year to come in and take board by board the meeting house apart and they packed it in to an 18 wheeler and after it was all packed they took off and down South Deerfield and it was put back together. I see three people in the audience who were there the day of the dedication of this meeting house. It is in such a serene, pleasant, and, and the, the building is, is beautiful inside. So that's, that's where the meeting house ended up. In. Now this is a, a shot of the Smith Neck Friends meeting house and that's located on Smith Neck Road and up until 1900 it was unprogrammed that is they did not have a pastor um, and now this is the Westport Friends meeting house which actually was um, a part of the um, history of Westport supported uh, um, by um, uh, Paul Cuffey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was here he also built the first school in Westport and I'm, I'm doing my research fine that it wasn't just a school, it was more of a religious school um, channeled by Paul Cuffey. This is the um, Allen's Neck Meeting House. <coughs> now here is Job S. Gidley. Job Scott was a Quaker minister <coughs> in Woonsocket or Smithfield, um, Rhode Island. And they were very, um, very religious. And he was named for Job Scott, it was Job S. Gidley. And he lived a big life, a full life. And in Quaker cir circles, there's such a thing as giving service that the young people would sometimes go off, you know, like I think the Mormon church still practices it, um, and there are other groups that do uh, go off and give service. Um, and Job left poor Susanna Tucker, who he had married, and they had four children, uh, to go and rescue and settle a group of peace, uh, pacifist um, persons from Russia. So what a challenge to leave Little Dartmouth, go to Russia, bring these people over into Canada. Canada gave them the land in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, both areas, and they built this so he, he was not around and his children had, and his wife had to carry on the farming there. This is the first house, um, no, this is the second house, I'm sorry. <coughs> Am I right? Yeah. Uh, of the Gidley Farm. But they have kept that place so pristine and, and, and in such good repair. Now, these are the two houses here. Um, he was an educator, of course, and then he um, decided that he possibly was, as he said, maybe uh, called to be town clerk. And he was town clerk, and there was nothing like what we have now. Uh, town meeting was very serious and the, the money that was spent was, had to be 
um, spent well. And so the other thing that some of the men objected to was his really going overboard on the equality of sex because he figured the women who were town meeting members had equal right to speak. And, there were, and even back then, there was this kind of um, mm, uh, not friendly persuasion at all. But, um, well, you know, not that you've spoken now, but um, you don't need to speak. Someone else just spoke for you. And, and he'd have nothing of that. So the, now we get to George Howland. Who was George Howland? Um, this was taken out of a book by Mary Tabor, Just a Few Friends. George Howland was born into the Howland family. There was a Dartmouth connection of the Howlands, whose center really was Round Hill on Smithneck Road. And Gideon Howland was the, um, one of the early members who was a member here. And so they would have to take horse and buggy from Round Hill to come to meeting here twice a week. And uh, so George married um, Suzanne and in, in so doing, um, they had their wedding in Quaker fashion where you do, you do not have a minister or, or someone marry you. You stand and repeat your vows and then following the uh, worship period, then um, you uh, sign a certificate of marriage. And I have a certificate of marriage of my great aunts. And in the second column, on the top, line one, is Joe Best Gidley. So that the Quakers here in Dartmouth really had a, a unique way of being family. Their faith was such that the... Um, so now, here's Rachel Howland. Rachel Howland was the wife of George Howland's oldest son. And Rachel Howland uh, founded the women's, uh, women's Relief Organization in New Bedford. And uh, she, she did a lot of good work. And it says here, even during the Civil War, um, she, uh, she managed to participate. That was Rachel. Now, this is Abraham Howland. He was the first mayor of New Bedford, even though he had Dartmouth beginnings. Now, this is the Howland Homestead at Round Hills. And if you look really hard, you can actually see there's more than one structure that's uh, put together. And that center structure is a, 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 a Dutch, Dutch hip roof. And that building was purchased by Doris Duke, the actress, uh, and had it floated on a uh, barge to Newport. And it is on Thames Street in Newport now, and it's painted blue. <laughs> and Hetty wouldn't have agreed. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the old homestead, and that's where many of the Quaker quarterly meetings were held at the Howland Farm. They called it the Howland Farm, and it uh, was Hetty Green's grandfather, Gideon Howland actually was the owner of this property. <coughs> and this is, a, uh, this is a traditional photo of a Quaker wedding, the bride and groom standing 
uh, beside each other um, uh, during the ceremony. Now, Manipas Teba, that's a mystery. That I was not able to get any information, um, and I didn't try hard because I'd been working on other things. But anyway, <laughs> Barnabas Teba, I'm sure, was related to William Teba, who was one of the two Quakers that met Frederick Douglass and his bride when they disembarked in Newport at, after yearly meeting. Um, you see, the Underground Railroad isn't quite understood by many people. I think I understand a little more, but um, it was a, a, um, a means through which the Quakers could serve m mankind, so to speak, and um, take them into their homes, these poor slaves that were running for their lives, uh, seeking freedom. Um, and so it was uh, William Tabor, who is related to Barnabas, but I haven't got that story completely down yet. Oh. Now, here we are, right here. See the fireplace? Mm -hmm. See? This is 1922. This is the filming of Down to the Sea in Ships, silent film. Um, Clara Bow's debut into movie making. This was her first movie, and, and uh, she was only 20 years old. Um, and here are some Quakers dressed, uh, I'm sure, in their grandmother's uh, outfits, uh, conferring with the filmmaker. Now, in this picture is also, if you look very closely, you'll see some andirons. It's got a round circle and a long neck, and there's an outstanding reward <laughs> for the recovery of two sets of andirons. Both sets were stolen out of the meeting house, as were the two heating stoves, the long ancient heating stone, uh, stoves were stolen. And then, you know, friends uh, uh, are up to date and modern too, and they decided enough is enough when everything was stolen almost, including the bearer for the casket when they'd have funerals here, um, they decided to put an alarm system. And the alarm system is excellent. It goes directly to the fire department. So no one is going to be able to burn this building down <laughs> as, as, as long as uh, we have electricity. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Now these are two bonnets, and um, they belong to the Gidley family. And all of the clothing from the Gidley family was donated through me from um, Alice, uh, no, uh, from Ruth Burgess, who was a descendant of um, the uh, one of the Gidley um, uh, daughters. So these are the sun bonnets, and all of the clothing is in, uh, rest, uh, in um, restored order. It's a Roach Jones stuff house. Now this is a picture of my uh, great aunt, Julia Smith Wood. And she and her husband were married in the New Bedford Friends meeting. And uh, then uh, uh, they were in the uh, wood business. And all of the <laughs> mahogany wood that came into New Bedford to make the mansions 
were somehow or another funneled through the lumber company called Green and Wood. And, and then, of course, I don't know how big the Panama Canal was then, but the mahogany had to get here somehow. Um, and whether, it, it, when was the Panama Canal built? Hmm? Mahogany came out of Cuba and what's now Brazil, British Honduras. Oh, okay, so they didn't have to go over no. to the other the side. Huge quantities of uh, mahogany was in Cuba and Honduras, Yucatan. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Now, she became an artist, <laughs> and I have mostly all of her paintings, and um, she. Uh, also became an Episcopalian. <laughs> she, she, left, she left the family. <coughs> but. Now, any idea where this is? Huh? No? Is that Michonne? Michonne Point. It's. Masham looking over the pond to Salter's Point. And it was here that one of my great grandfathers built the salt works, the first salt works in Dartmouth. After doing research, I found out that Rickardson Salt Works came after, and the South Dartmouth Salt Works came after. The, the timbers to make the salt works was sawed by hand, I mean, you know? Uh, and when the farm was sold to uh, the Cook family, it, uh, they dismantled the salt works, brought up all the lumber to 504 Smith Neck Road, and built that huge barn that's at 504 Smith Neck Road, which was my great 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 grandfather's um, barn. And inside, the framing of it, uh, the round holes where they put the, um, uh, they take a tree and hollow out the, the tree, you know, for, uh, uh, it, you know to carry the water through. Piping, it was all wooden, wooden piping. And so that was it. Now, here we are at the Cornell Farm in Wersham Point. And uh, water on both sides, and uh, that's looking over to Deepwater Point and uh, uh, Demers Lloyd Park. And you'll see there's a tower there, and that was a water tower. They used to pump the water up into there. Now, going back to 504 Smith Neck Road, there was a windmill. And, and we think now, oh, all this wind power and everything. Well, they were beautiful. They were made of wood. And um, they were, uh, the one on Smith Neck Road next to me is um, uh, no longer there. It was dismantled. It went down in a storm in the late 40s. And it was dismantled, but I have pictures of it. And it would pump the water from the well to a, uh, a receptacle in the barn in the top of the barn, the haymow, was where the water would be pumped up from um, the wind power, pu pulling the water up and there. Okay, now this is the other side of the Cornell house, and it, w it, was, um, it was built very early. Uh, six generations lived there. Uh, prior to 1776, which was a Revolutionary War. There was a British frigates off of Masham, and m m one of my great-great-grand 
parents uh, in good Quaker conscience traded with the British <laughs> and provided meat and then was asked once to provide medical emergency because the crew had come down with a fever and it, it was pretty serious so they rowed ashore and one of my grandfathers took a horse and buggy and went to New Bedford, got a doctor, rowed him out to the boat, but did not go on board. And the doctor treated, you know, they had like camphor and all these other things, to, and they didn't have medicine like we have it now. Um, and, the, and rode the doctor back to New Bedford after he had treated the, this fever. He came down with a fever and he died. And what I've been trying to do is research and find out who he was. I have not been, a, you know, I haven't spent the time looking through the uh, copy of the Standard Times or the Mercury to see um, who this doctor was that died. So the Cornells left Point in 1845 came up to Smith Neck Road in, and the farm still exists under the ownership of the trustees of reservations. It's open to people, um, sun up, sun down, um, and they're doing a wonderful job to preserve part of our history. This is the back of the Cornell um, property on Masham. Okay. Now in the back, to the side of the property, is a little graveyard. And in the graveyard are two stones. One, Mahitable Cornell, and uh, the other one. Oh, come on. John. Thank you. <laughs> and um, three children. And that cemetery. You see, years ago, cemeteries were allowed on, um, and still are, if you really find out that you can be buried in your own backyard. But, you know, for future generations, well, that, that's a, a puzzle. But I do know of two cases in Nonquit where there's been recent burials of people being buried in their own backyard. Now, this is the will of one of my grandfathers. This was Peleg Cornell, and he had five girls and six boys, and also a uh, servant named Hannah. And the friends had decided to really be friends and not participate in um, holding of slaves. And so um, John Woolman from New Jersey, a traveling friend whose main concern was to free, make these people free like like us, um, and uh, he came and he lectured twice in this meeting house. He said, I'm here, this is my first trip here, and I shall return, and when I return, I want the monthly meeting, which is the governing body of Quakers, to um, set all of their slaves free. And I've often wondered what happened to Hannah, because in his will he said he was setting her free on his death, but that if she wanted to be free, she would have to pay to her two, two eldest sons an amount of money. And I thought that was rather strange. <laughs> and, but. Uh, I know that the Howlands also had slaves, 
and the slocums were really bad. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they had uh, ample um, uh, assistance, but because of the um, uh, slocums, uh, Mr. Slocum, Henry Slocum, gave six acres of land on Pascamancet River to the Dartmouth Monthly Meeting. And this is where we sit today. This was, he owned over a thousand acres in Dartmouth, Henry Slocum. He owned all of Slocum Neck. He owned um, Bonnie's Joy. The, that whole area was owned by Slocum. And he also owned Cutty Hunk and two of the other, and it was known as uh, Slocum Island. It wasn't Cutty Hunk. It was known as Slocum Island. And um, let's see. Uh, Nashawina. Uh, I, I thought I wouldn't look at my notes, but um, uh, one other island. Hmm? He owned Nonamesset. 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 Ah, okay, thank you. So. This is the Swift House relocated fr uh, from Dartmouth, now on Masham Point. This house here was located up at, you know this, at the head of the river there in, in uh, upon Agansett Bay, there's some kind of a pumping station or a water station. Mm -hmm. uh, this house was actually there and it was built in 1700. It is now on Masham and it was moved in 1930 to its present location. That's 1700, that's... Now, this is a little cottage tucked away on Little River Road, and near to it is the burial ground of Lieutenant John Smith. And I took Mary and Bruce the other day on a little trip, and I said, "Well, we'll, we'll go see. We'll, we'll go see John Smith's burial lot." And we couldn't get through. So anyway, and this property is owned by uh, Kathleen uh, Ryan, um, Comiskey Roberts. Can you imagine having all those names? Well, and she would have loved to have been here. She's in her 99th year. She's in Savannah, Georgia at a National Teachers Convention. <laughs> and she wrote the pamphlet of the Secrets of Old Dartmouth. And if any of you here had her as a teacher, you had a gem. Did you have her as a teacher? and writing this pamphlet called The Secrets of Old Dartmouth. Um, someone who has never gotten old, who, whose mind is as keen as when I was a little kid. Yes, and she will be summering here this summer, hopefully with her, her niece, uh, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy's here. I know, I, I, I went like this. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy came down from Rainham to hear this talk. Now, where's this? 
Round Hill. What do you see in the picture in Round Hill that brings back any history to the town? Yes, the Charles W. Morgan uh, was docked there, and, and my brother and I, I, I think we even went and played on the Morgan. Um, I mean, the kids, you know, uh, it was fun. So, uh, that's, there's no longer there. There are three things in this film presentation you'll see that are no longer at Round Hill, and it's a shame. It's, a part of our history gone forever. So, but they have rebuilt the Charles W. Morgan and it will be coming back to New Bedford next year. And there's talk about the closing the dike and not letting her out. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of back and forth between, the, between City Hall and, and, the, and, the, and the Mystic Seaport about where Charles Morgan really belonged. Oh. And a lot of uh, fun, funny about how they're going to close the dike wall <laughs> leave it here in perpetuity. Well, it's the only whale ship left. And uh, so I'm glad that they, they restored it. It's also the one that's the closest um, to the Akushman on the Sherman Melville sail to the Pacific. It's almost an identical twin of the Akushman. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Now this is a picture of the radio, radio station down at Round Hills. Anybody here remember going to Round Hills to hear the radio presentation? Well, um, you know, I just can't figure out how Colonel Green was the son of Hetty Howell. <laughs> <laughs> because he was so, so generous, so free. He gave my father a goat. And my father brought the goat home in the back seat of our old car <laughs> and let the goat out. The goat's name was Ling Ding. <laughs> and um, that was my playmate. <laughs> my, my mother didn't mind at all. The goat would butt me down and knock me flatter than a flat, and I'd get up, and, and it was play. Was that, that's my only connection of, uh, of, to, um, to Colonel Green, because I, w I was too young to have benefited from the bus he bought for the girls to go to school. <laughs> he bought a bus and delivered all the girls to the public schools. He would not allow a boy on the bus. <laughs> so the bu boys had to ride their bicycles to Pednarum to go to school after they had left Smith Neck. Now, I didn't re I, you know, you s my history course, my history, Dartmouth history in high school was the worst waste of time <laughs> because we were not taught anything but keep still. Uh, I mean, the, dar uh, the teacher would use other language too. <laughs> and then we would sit. And there was so much to learn. There was so much here. One of my saddest days was when they did this. And I, I feel very bad about this because this was the basis, the base of this martini glass was actually the, um, the innards of the radio transmitting um, station, and it was blasted, gone, gone forever. <coughs> now, generator at Round Hill, 
I, I, after college, I worked at MIT for a while, and I, I kept hearing about this Van Groff uh, atom spl uh, splitter mm, generator. It didn't make any sense to me at all, but it makes sense now. And it was built and located here at Round Hill. World, world famous. And then it was transferred up to MIT because Sylvia um, Howland, um, oh, I can't remember her married name. Um, yeah, um, sold the estate to MIT, or was given the estate to MIT, uh, MIT. and then they started doing research there. MIT was doing research on fog and the planets and oh, all kinds of electrical. Um, uh, different systems of, uh, of uh, generation of, uh, of the atmosphere. And this was in our own backyard. We had towers down in our woods that MIT leased the land for these towers. And I was too young to really grasp what was going on. So anyway, now, this is the monster that came in the night. This is the new house that they built at, at Round Hill. And it's a shame because, well, we, don't, we can't control things like this. And, uh, Marshall, was Colonel Green a Quaker? Yes. Okay. And this, this is a picture of him and his, his family. Um, at age 17, he <coughs> lost his leg uh, to the knee, uh, and so had a, a wooden leg and had an automobile built. So he stood up in it rather than sit. And the, these are pictures of he and his bride, Mabel, who was a Texan. Uh, gal um, and some of their friends. And down here is a picture of the airport where the um, Goodyear blimp was stationed. And uh, Eddie Rickenbacker had just returned uh, nonstop from uh, Paris and, and landed here. Landed at Round Hill. Can you believe that? And, and that's a picture. Now up in this picture here is uh, Captain Fred Tilton, who was a local uh, boy who grew up in the uh, whaling era and uh, made it to, um, the, through the North Passage um, up to the, the Arctic area there. And when the boats got frozen in, it was he who left with a Indian squaw and hides of animals to walk to get help. That, that's an amazing story that he um, was able to do that. So in his retirement, he was the captain of the Charles W. Morgan when it was birthed at Round Hills, and he used to sit and people would come and visit, and he'd give them all this information about um, what life was like on a, a whale ship. And this is this uh, article, Last Whaler Restored, and something about it. And it'll be exciting come next year to be able to Can hopefully. Yeah. Well, you know, I snip all my newspapers, I clip out all the interesting things and throw them in folders. And this is one of the byproducts of one of those 
the, um, the telling about the restoring of, of the Chelsea Logan. There's one more slide, Marcia. Okay. Okay. This I thought was a happy ending to a, a story, of a family story. And this is a Van Fleet Rose. And it came from the property that I own now that was my great grandfather's. And this rose was there when he lived there in um, 1860, 1860, 1865. So I hope you've enjoyed some of the things I've uh, spoken uh, about. But I have to ask that we not stop here. We've got to start really doing something constructive about saving our history. And the Quaker story is a beautiful story. And I, I just look forward to being a Quaker forever. I miss being a birthright Quaker because my mother was not a Quaker when she married my father, even though we were married in the Quaker meeting house and everything. Uh, she belonged to the Baptist faith. And uh, so um, I missed being um, a uh, birthright. My brother who's here is a birthright. So he, he made it, but I didn't. <laughs>
to free them to be free. And Lucretia Mott then also was involved with the women's uh, uh, movement and, uh, and the right to vote and things like that. See, um, the, the Quakers were always public spirited. They were, they were concerned about home rule, equal for sexes, um, all of these things that all tied in one little uh, ball that, um, and people don't understand. And when someone will say to me, the Quakers, they never wrote anything down. The Quakers wrote volumes. And then the Rhode Island Historical Society uh, in Providence, you, you can go and read the early minutes of Dartmouth Monthly Meeting. And it will say, so-and-so was disowned for different reasons. Because the friends were very strict in, in their belief of, of uh, equality and um, correct behavior and things like that. Yeah, Pam. Well, I was thinking your, your remarks about equality, they had the same attitude towards children, that children's ideas could, should be listened to. Mm -hmm. I thought of that movie, The Friendly Persuasion, which is not from around here, but it did give an example of the first time the young boy stood up and spoke in meeting and it was listened to respectfully just like everyone else. And that's why we have Friends Academy today. We should mention I uh, think Friends Academy in dark. You know, you know some about the, the starting of Friends Academy. What was that? Friends Academy, well, Academy, 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 Academy. Friends Academy was founded by two friends, right, yeah. but not supported by the monthly meeting. Oh. A, a really unusual situation. But um, there were other schools that were springing up um, in New Bedford, private schools before the public schools. But I do want to stress that I was colored blind. I didn't know what a black person was. My parents never, ever made any remarks that would be um, against the dignity of another person. My grandfather sponsored four Cape Verdean men from Cape Verde to work on the farm. They, they weren't slaves, they were workers. They, their way got paid over here, they got a wage, they got housing and they got food. And at the end of five years or six years, they were free to leave and none of them wanted to leave and one man left um, Mr. De Grace or we call him Grace now um, wouldn't leave the area and uh, located uh, over on Little River Road and uh, so but the secretness of the Underground Railway still bugs me because I don't think people understand that it had to be secret. How did William Tabor and, and his friend know that that boat was coming into that pier in Newport, that they were to meet the, Mr. Johnson and his bride? Because his name was Johnson before it was Douglas. And he got his, he, and, yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, people question these ethics of uh, why didn't the Quakers, they did, they, they did all that they could to, to um, make it possible for people to be freed. Other than, and I must say that the Brown family in Providence, if you've read anything about the Browns, there was uh, Moses Brown and his brother John, and um, they still, the first port to reach after leaving 
Cape Verde with the slaves was Bristol, Rhode Island, and that's where they held the slave auctions in Bristol, Rhode Island. Not in the mid, in the mid states at all. I think it's also important to note that the Quakers were not universally accepting of black people. For example, Paul Cuffey was denied admission to, so meet, to all jobs? the meetings in this area, including this one, I believe. Yeah. And that's why he moved to Westport, <coughs> the only meeting that did accept him, why he built the school and the community there that he did. So there was an ambivalence, uh, certainly. Um, something that's not related to Quakerism, apparently, but Frederick Douglass was trained by his previous owner to be a ship hawker. And so I believe his friendly uh, uh, sponsor uh, said, well, why don't you go and get a job down on, on the docks to make sure you're safe. When he walked out of the job the first day, every workman down there put their tools down and walked off the job and said, as long as this man is here, we don't work. And they weren't Quakers, I don't think. But I mean, I, no, no. I think there's a historical, uh, there was a uh, progression, shall we say, between acceptance of slavery um, to a simple, we intrinsically want to uh, help the slaves, but we don't want them to be part of our religion. Um, but that certainly was not uh, the case of all Quakers. Some of them were very welcome to them from the early time. It's a very complicated historical, from what I, I, I've just been learning this stuff as a docent of the women this year. Hmm. But, but still, they were, for example, Nathan and Polly Johnson were, uh, worked in the home of Charles W. Morgan as free, uh, free and, with, and treated respectively. The uh, caterer, cook, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing about New Bedford, I, I can't speak as much for Dartmouth, but the thing about New Bedford, which was really extraordinary and unique in the country, was that New Bedford's elite and pa most powerful people, the ship owners, the bankers, the insurance brokers on the, on the whole, were Quakers. And so you had a greater number of people who would come here through the Underground Railroad because they knew that they would be protected by the Rodney Frenchers and the Joseph Ricketsons and Tabors, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and would find refuge with the Johnsons and with other families. There was a lot of, not social integration, but geographical integration in New Bedford along near the friend, your friends meeting you there, uh, abolitionist row between the Johnson House and the Roach Jones Stuff House. Um, people who taught them, we think, children fugitives in their homes, we think. I've been looking into that, trying to find some documentary evidence. But that was quite unique. And it's probably better social mobility for a lot of people at that time than there is for our college graduates today. Because you could get a Frederick Douglass coming and shoveling coal for Ephraim Peabody at the, at the church and work his way up to be you know, one of the greatest people in world history. Um, most literate, et cetera. But you also had fugitive slaves who would arrive in New Bedford and become doctors, ministers, lawyers, pharmacists, et cetera. In other words, go into professions, William Henry Johnson, Johnson. through the apprentice system, became an attorney and so on. So it's, it's, it became a destination, not just a station on the under, underground railroad. And it's quite extraordinary for that reason. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I remember going to a talk at the New Bedford Friends meeting, um, and I remember the name of the, the book um, by a Quaker woman. It was um, Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship. And I thought, it was really, um, I thought it was really um, remarkable that, um, well, and, it, and it's kind of sad in a way that the, like, the Quakers are kind of representative of any other kind of social or religious group that even though they belonged to a group, people had different thoughts and feelings and ideas about, <clears throat> you know, abolition and, um, but what I thought was remarkable was that the, the friends were willing to like admit that, well, we had this, this stand about, you know, not having slaves, but um, like this gentleman said, we didn't necessarily want to be, be friends with the, the fugitive slaves. 
Um, but like any other group, um, people make up their mind individually how they're going to live and how they're going to treat other people. So sometimes I think the Quakers are held to a higher standard than other groups because I, I feel they, they did more than other groups to end um, slavery and to, to stop it. But yet they're held, well, why didn't you go all the way and, you know, you know invite them into your home and religion? Following on what Pat's saying, in the literature, uh, the prime example is Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is really quite a, a, a misunderstood and devalued work today, um, because most people don't read it. It's really quite an extraordinary book with whatever faults it has. But it, that exemplifies a theme in many, many uh, fictional books of the time, as well as fusion of slave narratives that when a fugitive half-star takes the risk of going to a home because there's a nice light in the window, there's enormous relief to find out that the kindly people in that home who give them food and, and take care of them are Quakers. And whenever they know that someone is a friend, um, that theme is that we're safe, we're safe, we're, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be taken care of. I'd like so, to interject here. Um, I really didn't cover the family life of Quakers, of the importance of, of parenting and how, um, how it, it, it uh, affected the, the children and the education and the educational standards. My brother and I, I, I don't want to impose personal things, but my brother and I are only a a year and a half apart in age, but I'm the elder, so I, I was I was able to be the boss, and we're we're, we're playing we're playing with a can, um, a peanut can, uh, planted peanuts, uh, a metal can, and it's got pennies in it, and we're under the table playing. And my brother opens his mouth, and one of the pennies went in his mouth, and he swallowed it. <laughs> so that was monthly meeting night. And we never miss monthly meeting. My parents never miss monthly meeting. We had to go along. So I went out from under the table, and I said, Mom, I, Mama, I don't think we, we can go to you, uh, go to uh, um, monthly meeting tonight, and she said, why? She, well, Rusty just swallowed a penny. <laughs> and so my father came in and everything was quiet. We never had swearing in our home. We never had hostility. It, it was a very peaceful upbringing that we both had. And so my father came in and my mother says, well, um, you've got something you've got to handle or something. And my father says, what's that? And he says, well, she said, Russ swallowed a penny and Masha thinks that we can't go to monthly <laughs> meeting. So he said, I can settle that in no time. He went to the phone and he called our great uncle who was a, a physician in New Bedford and said, Russ swallowed a penny, and it's monthly meeting, and uh, that shouldn't uh, affect. And, and Uncle Russell says, of course not. Just give him loads of mashed potato. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the, but we never, neither my brother nor I, ever felt hostile or in an environment there wasn't peace. And I think that's the family structure. A real Quaker family is one that, um, that practices its faith. Yeah, Laurie. Again, I just wanted to add that another thing about the way that, uh, to go along with what you said, that, that Stowe structures her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is based on documents and slave narratives and history, but she structures it so that the ideal families in the book 
are the black families and the Quaker families. And you have a kind of a spectrum of evil and less evil southern slaveholding families and bigoted northern white families. And then you have the Quakers and the really caring black parents who are trying to get free and bring up their children well and so on, which is very interesting because her audience, of course, was whites. And what she wanted to show was how slavery destroys the family, um, women, children, and, um, and Christian people. So it's a very interesting. But you see, um, I, me I meant to say in, in describing the building here, that these petitions do come down and the women would have their business meeting uh, um, behind closed um, doors and the men would have theirs. But there was always a gentleness or, or, or concern for equality. Equality in sex, equality in business. Um, so, I'd like maybe to have another lecture um, for, um, and have other people join. I have a, a woman who actually uh, I talked with this week that um, she has children and she's a writer and she would like to write a book about the salt works of Dartmouth. And I said, oh, that's great. Let's, uh, let's consider it. So if there's anyone here that would like to have an ongoing relationship with the Dartmouth Historical and Art Society, please join us. Um, our next event will be a band concert. Um, what's his name? Philip Souza. Um, <laughs> Fourth of July. It, it'll be um, July 2nd. No, 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 no. In, in celebration of 4th of July. <laughs>